when somebody all of, all of a sudden is going to come and say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't use water now. So, so we've got to make some provision, change the grasses, or get some water on the golf course, make some provision that you have access to water within your control. Over the next few years, we are going to have to look very seriously at how we actually uh, store water and how we actually manage it as a resource. We believe it's undervalued uh, at present. Uh, certainly, we would like to, to see possible increase in charges to reflect the actual true cost of water. Um, the environment needs water, everyone needs water. Creating winter storage areas on golf course will be one uh, key role that golf has to play. What about the use of grey water? The water recycling, uh, utilising rainwater, rainwater capture. Uh, reed bed systems are becoming increasingly important. If we can take uh, water from the clubhouse, for example, pass it through reed bed systems and put that back into our, our winter storage. Licensing, it's on a first come, first serve basis at the moment. There are major changes coming along in terms of legislation. There's a water bill before Parliament at the moment, which may well turn it on its head. And we may decide, or certainly government may decide, that we need to look at water use. So it may well be public water supply, it may well then be agriculture, industry, and then leisure will come somewhere down that, that picking order, I'm afraid. New golf course designs can look at uh, drainage uh, aspects, bringing those into winter storage areas, uh, surface runoff again to winter, for winter capture. There's a lot of ways in which we now need to kind of to, to bring together all of these things to, to ensure that we have a supply without necessarily relying on summer winter abstraction, uh, which is just not available. It's not around when we want it, in the right quantities, at the right time, in the right place. So again, there has to be a, a major shift in, by, by all of us um, to actually ensure that we use it wisely. The birthplace of the game Scotland has deeper golfing roots than most. Traditionally, water supplies have been free and easy, almost literally. There's no system of abstraction control in Scotland, unlike England and Wales. And for the past few years, SEPA has been asking the Scottish Government to bring in uh, a system similar to that down south. We've got cases uh, or evidence of over-abstraction, certainly on, on the east coast, during dry summers on uh, small burns, which is causing problems. And there's a, a new European directive which is uh, going to be coming in uh, over the next, or gradually being introduced over the next few years. And this is, uh, we hope, uh, going to pave the way for some form of abstraction control in Scotland. Basically a prior authorisation system, uh, unless they can demonstrate that the abstraction wouldn't cause any impacts on the aquatic environment. This anticipated about turn in approach to abstraction control in Scotland is perhaps inevitable. Clubs need to be taking responsibility uh, with regard to where that water comes from, even if they can't provide their own source by sinking a borehole or uh, having a, a reservoir on site, which some of the bigger clubs have. They need to be aware that they can play a role in uh, responsible water usage, and that might be you know, getting in touch with the environment agency and making sure they know where the water's coming from and how much water they're allowed to use. Um, the environment agency will cooperate with clubs who want to get this information because it's the long-term goal of everyone, I think, in responsible environmental management to manage water as a, a finite resource. The way that I manage the, the course itself, I always tend to underwater than overwater. You know, I tend to get the plant working for its living and get the roots down. The borehole itself provides the water on the whole of the course and it leads into the main irrigation feed tank. It provides all the water for the golf course itself. Uh, there is a limit to uh, 14,000 cubic metres a year up to press since the course has been opened. We've only used just over 7,000 cubic metres, obviously with the weather conditions. The course was designed as a resort course, uh, as part of a, a hotel golf course complex. Therefore, in looking at the golf course, we had to decide what the need for irrigation was. Uh, and initially we turned around and said, well, the need for irrigation is to have the course in play 365 days a year. Uh, you've got to have good greens, good tees, good approaches, good fairways. So initially one looked at it and said, maybe we need to irrigate the fairways. We then looked at the location in the country and, and exactly where it was. And we realized that the rainfall was fairly high there at any rate. 
Um, and to actually put irrigation system on a fairways up in that area might have been detrimental. So at the end of the day, the decision was to put an irrigation system in for greens, approaches and tees. So you're keeping the major playing areas of the course in first class condition. If the fairways do get a bit hard in summer, it's not going to hurt that type of course. The type of play they have there will not be detrimental. So we looked at the irrigation system and the need of it. We then looked around and said, well, what water do we require? And we calculated the water requirement for the maximum annual requirement. Now, they have no natural water on, on course. The odd stream, which I doubt very much we'd have got a license to abstract from. So we went to the environmental agency and applied for a license for a borehole. So the water supply on Hollins Hall is from a borehole uh, into storage tank, which is a 24-hour storage tank, and then pumped out overnight. The control system is not the most sophisticated, but it's sufficient for what they require for greens and teas. The big advantage with a system like that is they've got an infrastructure which can be added onto. They've got the underground mains and they've got the underground cable, uh, which is sufficient and designed to do the system. If they need to irrigate small areas extra, they can do it. If they want to update to a modern computer system, they can update to a modern computer system. They can add things like weather stations. It's an ongoing scenario. Computers are, are the things, and I'm looking at uh, sort of short term in the next year or two years of having a PC control system. But obviously, more labour saving, more water saving, and more control on the course. And more people are taking water out of the ground. So, you know, you've got to be really efficient on, on how you use the water and not be you know, greedy. From the views of a young greenkeeper at a new course to the irrigation philosophies of two of the most established and experienced role models. I'm a bit old fashioned, if you like, but I, I like to keep it lean and lean and hungry, if you like. Uh, that way, I think you've always got it on tap. Uh, we have a full irrigation system, for example, at Turnbury, where I'm um, full fairway irrigation system, greens, teas, water warm, in fact. But as I said, it's so varied. Last year, for example, we had a fairly wet summer. I think we only used it on three evenings in the whole year. And the year before, only five evenings in the whole year. This year in particular, we've had a dry year. It's been on almost every night for about three months on the trot. So I think a lot of it is experience. You look at the turf. Um, you know, I know there are water gauges and temperature meters and God knows what. But I like to look at it and feel it. Anticipation is a big thing. Um, I'm a great believer, you know, you look at the forecast. If you know you've got a long hot spell coming, the forecasts now are pretty good. They're about probably 80, 90% accurate in our neck of the woods. So, you know, if you've got some rain, although you may be dry, but if the rain's forecast, there's no need to water. But some people don't do that. They just put it on auto, on their irrigation on auto, and go home on a Friday night and uh, don't really think about um, the consequences. Colour has become the great god, has been for many years. This is not new, this phenomenon. Uh, but it, it's still not gone away. It hasn't gone away over here, that American-type influence, as you want to call it. It's still very dominant over here. And, of course, people, the, the, the paying customer, is generally looking at this element of colour and aesthetics, generally, uh, without uh, real knowledge of what a uh, turf in this country could or should look like, especially in dry conditions. It does not take on a particularly strong green hue. And we do not want to play golf of turf. It's got a thick, sort of thatchy sort of you know, a, a strong, lush uh, appearance, because you can't spin the ball from that kind of turf anyway. We have two golf courses at Turnbury, and on one golf course in particular, the, the, um, it's now called the entire course, I haven't used one ounce of fungicide in 15 years, because it was always the poor relation. Uh, they had an inadequate water system years ago, so it never actually got over watered. And then our, our main course, the championship course, over the years, the demand for television and, um, and tournaments, etc., has been overwatered. And the two types of greens are chalk and cheese. And I think it's a very simple lesson for us all to learn there. There's no benefit to the game of golf or golfing turf in the overuse of water. It's obviously detrimental, as we've heard, and uh, it's something that should be used uh, leniently and little and often um, in dry spells. And obviously, has to be assessed on different soil types. I mean, there's, there's variance on uh, how much is required on golf courses, but um, it's something that fine grasses don't need a great deal of. And the, the, the crucial issue, I think, on our side, one of them anyway, is, is getting the water to the right place in the root zone. 